public attending just to know how I should speak in the, in the talk. Are you from government, from utilities, from government? Very interesting. Okay. I, I would like to share the OGCL, the Open Grid Client Laboratory for the Electric Energy Transition. It's something we are doing in Hydro-Quebec uh, and we hope to, to share it and also to have feedback. I'll go fast because I will try to cover a lot of content. Uh, I will share a little bit which is the background and context. Uh, what is the open lab? I will just refer it as open lab. How can the open lab be used? Uh, why is it relevant? And which is our current work and future work? I have just one objective, which is to share what we are doing and to have feedback from you. So I'll try to, I will try to go fast and to save a few minutes at the end to make a discussion because I feel it's more interesting. This is our lab. Uh, Hydro-Quebec has a lot of different labs for transmission, tra production, distribution, this is for the client. So we are the ones that have complaints from the clients and from the grid as well. Uh, that's our job and we do research. We have a lot of nice facilities. We have uh, photovoltaic panels, we have electric cars, we have batteries, we have uh, rechargers, we have inverters, we have very nice facilities. We have very nice and expensive data ca capture systems even though it's a mess to actually have data, <laughs> even though it's, it's very nice. Uh, when, uh, how I will say it, it's not 2023 friendly, let's say, okay? Uh, when we need to analyze data, we need to go to the technician, and the technician need to go to a computer and download that data into a USB, and after transfer it to us, it's not actually, it's not what's supposed to be, okay? So we start an effort to modernize the infrastructure of the lab, to put everything into the cloud, to transfer it to Databricks, so then the scientists like me can do data science and these kind of things. So we are modernizing the lab because we're having a problem and we cannot interconnect the labs neither. So what you do in one lab is not affecting the other labs. So that's another thing we were not able to do. Now with the modernization we are doing, we will be able to do it. We start with two questions. This is the context. Uh, which is our role as utility? Uh, what, what is what we're supposed to do for the energy transition? And uh, what we see in the current ecosystem is what you can see there. Uh, usually you make contracts with aggregators and then those aggregators sell devices to the end uh, customers and they manage uh, whatever devices they sold to the users and they make a contract with the utility to offer a service. For example, I want to reduce the load at certain periods of time, they will do it, okay? But the houses in orange, they will not be able to lease in whatever is shared to the houses in blue. Every system is private, every system is isolated from the other and that's the way it is designed. And of course you have other players like Google, Amazon, Alexa, which have a lot of power that they not necessarily are sharing the vision of the grid and are not necessarily contributing to the grid needs. So what we say is instead of uh, trying to manage everything, our role as a utility is more to build uh, the ecosystem uh, which will be the foundational base in which other players can build on top of that. When we talk about energy transition, in, in very oversimplified way, what we are saying is we need to electrify everything uh, with clean energy. That's, that's basically, we will electrify everything. So we as utility, we need to be, uh, create the ecosystem that will allow other places to build on top. The electricity will be the basic layer of society. And a lot of things is going to build on top. And we need to create the right incentives to actually call these people and participate with us. Uh, and the second question is how can we go orders of magnitude faster? Uh, I feel, and it's my personal opinion, <laughs> Uh, we will not be able actually to make the energy transition uh, with the ambitious goals that we have. We need to go orders of magnitude faster. So how we will do it? We cannot continue working in a centralized way. Uh, we need to distribute the work. The, the problems we are facing as utility is the same problems that other utilities are facing around the world in Canada, in USA, everywhere. So why we don't distribute the work and 
tackle together why we don't go open source, open data, uh, open infrastructure. So that's basically the context. Uh, we were having a problem. Our labs were not 2023 friendly. Uh, we modernized our lab. Uh, we start to ask the question to ourselves, which is our role as utility? Well, we need to create ecosystems that will allow other players, other stakeholders to build on top. Uh, we need to create the right incentives for those people to actually participate. Uh, and we need to go faster. So we need to go open source and open data. And the intersection of those three, of those three things is what we call the open lab. So modern lab, with the right uh, tools to build on top and the capacity to go faster. So what exactly is, and what is our idea, is to share all the complexity and integrate intricate interconnections that occur between the grid and the end customer. There is a lot of different steps uh, on, on, on the middle and it's not easy. And we want to make it visible, accessible, and we want to make it easy to contribute on top of that. And this, I will take a little bit of more time. I was trying to search this Zoom here, but I was not able to find it. But it's okay. I will use at least uh, this. Okay, so here you see the grid, and this is the physical infrastructure of the grid. After you have what we call the grid intelligence, the electric grid will evolve into more, let's say, a smarter system that will ingest a lot of data, but will be able to detect its own needs on real time. For example, I know that this line is going to be congested in a few hours, and it will be able to share. We will have intelligence, distributed intelligence on the grid doing these kind of things. I know this transformer, I know this neighborhood is going to have problems. I will share that information. After you have the middleware, which is, okay, there we have a problem, localized problem, how we're going to share that with which customers. So we're not going to share that information with everyone because not everyone is interested on in that. We need to share it with the specific customers that are uh, touched by that problem. And that's the middleware. After we have the communication, we need to have a standards uh, to communicate. Uh, after we have the building intelligence itself, which is the one that is going to listen to the needs of the grid and is going to take actions on top of, of based on those uh, communications. So it's going to optimize the consumption. It's going to anticipate the problems in the future and, for example, heat the house in advance. Uh, we have a very big problem with the gestion de reprise à prépend is uh, after the electricity cut uh, and it's very cold, uh, you have that when the electricity come back, like all the heating systems start at the same time. And if you were not, uh, I don't know, cooking because there were no electricity, now you will cook. And if you were waiting to wash your clothes, now you will wash your, your clothes. So a system that normally consumes 10 units, now it's consuming 30 units. So you have three times more demand in that period, and then you need to create a system to support three times the demand it's supposed to, to support just for a few hours. So you are paying three times more just for a few hours. So that's a critical problem, and we need to find a way to, to face that. And then you have the edge middleware, and you have uh, this, we work with Linux Foundation. We use software from Linux Foundation, and you have Home Assistant. Home Assistant, now it becomes an operative system that you can plug more than 1,000 different devices. So we are, able, we are able to plug the building intelligence with the Home Assistant, and we will be able to control more than 1,000 different devices. Uh, but it's going to be controlled by the intelligence itself, not by the utility, not by Hydro Quebec. So those things, is the things that we want to share and we want to make open and we want everyone to build on top of that. So how can the Open Lab be used? So you have utilities, of course, that will be interested in building the intelligence that is going to detect the needs and is going to share the needs. Uh, you have universities, uh, of course. You have the collaborative uh, research. Uh, 
you have startups that will be interested and regulators I will go back after how it's interesting for regulators. And one of the cool things that we can do with this kind of approach is that we can take, uh, let's imagine uh, I, I need to make the control system for a house uh, for the electric charger of the vehicle, for example. Universities are very good developing the algorithms that we will use. Uh, we can make the infrastructure in a way that they plug the algorithm in one side, we test it on the real lab, we see how it behaves, then a startup can take those tests and develop a product that they can sell into the market. So we are effectively minimizing the distance between the university production and something, a product that can go into the market. So we are speeding up the technology readiness level of multiple products by making these available. So it's not only open source, not only open data, but it's also open infrastructure. And uh, why is it relevant? Well, of course, we will be gathering data and sharing the data. Uh, of course, we will be having the flexibility to test uh, multiple things. We will have collaborative development. We will speed up the technology readiness level from university to market. Uh, we will have a common test bench to test the different things. Uh, but this is something, I don't know if there is some economist, uh, it, it will be interesting to discuss. Uh, it, it historically have existed an, a power asymmetry between the utility and the customer. Utilities are natural monopolies, and it makes sense because, I mean, the infrastructure they need to build. But they always have more power than the customers. And historically, even in the past, they will call uh, rate payers, and not even customers. It's just someone that is paying for something. Uh, now we, we evolve, we call it customers, we call it users. But what we can do with this kind of infrastructure and the way we are thinking to give the intelligence to the building that is going to learn the preferences of the users, uh, you are empowering the customer. And, and you are reducing the asymmetry of power that exists between the utility and the customer. And that's the part that will be interesting to discuss with the customers. I feel you are increasing the size of the pie. I mean, I feel you are increasing the economic efficiency of the system. I feel you are increasing the social welfare by empowering the customers. The customers have no choice. They need to buy electric energy, and the only way they can buy it is through the utility. But if you give them options, and where those options are going to come, and this is just what is going to happen in the future. Users will have more power to generate their own electricity. Now they can install renewable generation. Now they can store energy in their electric vehicles. We will see liberalization on the markets at the retail level. So now the users will be able to sell that energy, to sell it to their neighbors, to sell it to the grid back, and then they will be able to make these kind of negotiations. And then you will have the choice. I will not buy from the utility. I will buy from my neighbor. And that's how you empower the customers. And more importantly, uh, all those intelligence that I'm talking about, they will be powered by artificial intelligence. Uh, it's not the user who is going to check which is the price of the energy and then take a decision if he's going to consume energy or not. That's not what is going to happen. It's an algorithm that is able to learn the preferences of the user. For example, he prefers 20 degrees in his room but uh, 18 degrees in, in the kitchen. You can do the, we are already doing these kind of things. It's not that difficult. So these algorithms will be able to learn that and will represent the customers on the market. And then you will have customers that have more power. What is interesting about this and what is critical for utilities is that it's not that these algorithms are mean or are bad or are good. If, if there are vulnerabilities in the system, they will find it and they will exploit it. If they find out that by lying, then they can modify the clearing price of the market on their favor. They will lie. And, and that's not because they are mean, it's because that's the way they are designed. So we as utilities, 
we need to uh, prepare for that. How we can design a system that is robust enough to actually anticipate the actions of millions and millions of devices, smart devices that will try to play against us. They are selfish by nature. So that's a very interesting challenge. And uh, using that kind of infrastructure that we are proposing, uh, we will speed up the way that universities can plug these kind of algorithms into the system. And then we can test what actually happened. And then we can modify what we are doing as incentives and as control mechanism to limit what is happening, the effects of what these algorithms will cause. Uh, I will finish with this, and I would love to discuss after. But what we are doing now is we need to have the minimum viable product by this winter. We are currently working on this. Uh, we will make a native integration into Home Assistant. Now we are connected, but it's not native. Uh, Home Assistant is like an operative system, like Android or iOS, and you can have like an app store inside. So the same way you download Instagram or WhatsApp into your phone, you can go to Home Assistant and download the Hydrokevake application, and automatically it will make your home compatible with the needs of the grid and with whatever Hydro Quebec is sharing. Uh, we are working on that. We need to work also to how to integrate commercial and institutional buildings. That's a little bit more challenging. Uh, and finally, we need to see how we can integrate the, the intelligence of the grid into, into the system. Uh, and this is what I, I will finish with this. Uh, it is interesting for regulators. This is in Europe. I was in France in a conference recently. And they make something called energy communities. Uh, very interesting. They have different projects. They have different partners. They have five pilot, uh, five sites, five installations of communities in different countries. And what they did is they gathered a community neighborhood and they say let's go to buy i don't know some generation some pv uh, i will buy for me i will buy for the community uh, we will have the right to share we will have the right to buy and sell um, the energy and uh, then you can test what happened so why this is interesting a project like this uh, we can deploy it like very fast with the lab we are proposing so because the code is going to be open source, you can create the infrastructure and you can create a replica of the lab in whatever you want. You want to create it in Ontario. You want to create it in British Columbia. You just literally copy the code, paste it, and deploy it again. So these kind of communities, it will be very easy to deploy. And then you will have like a constrained space, restricted space. With, of course, with the signature of, of the users and everything, but you can have like a regulatory sandbox there. So we can develop new algorithms and put it, for example, that they're going to negotiate into the market and have, I don't know, 100 customers agree to participate. And then you have a regulatory sandbox there that you can test and you can measure the effects. And utilities, of course, are interested into this, but maybe governments as well. Uh, will be interested. So I know it's uh, a lot, uh, but that's basically the main idea. And I would love to to take this to take questions and listen what what you think. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just uh, just so I get it right, you you have kind of a home intelligent heating uh, control system I installing in houses uh, that that you're looking to gather information from and then taking I, I guess intelligent decision from <clears throat> from from information gathered from those units. But 
is that uh, I'm, is that just from the the the, the kind of uh, I'm assuming it's similar to some like Google Nests or stuff like that. Uh, is it just from that, or do you, do you also have information that's coming from like real time energy consumption, like at the? Uh, I'm I'm just wondering how if it's just like uh, if it's going to be just from from those few houses that that have kind of the the Hydro Quebec u unit, or or if it's yeah. going to be more widespread and and how yeah, you go maybe from from like a few managing ma managing demand from a few. From, from, I guess, a few samples, if you will, to, yeah. to the whole grid? Yeah, that, that's, that's a very interesting question. Uh, usually, th this is what is happening now, okay? So you have an aggregator, call it, uh, I don't know, I don't know if British Columbia has an aggregator. We have one called ILO uh, in Quebec. And he creates its own devices. He creates its own thermostats. He creates its own control, for example, for the electric vehicle recharge. Uh, but you, you as user, you need to own that system. Otherwise, you will not be connected to Hydro Quebec. That's what we want to change, <laughs> basically. Uh, what happened with the users that have Google? What happened with the users that didn't like the system? They, do, they want to buy something else. Um, that's, that's the kind of thing that and that's why we say we need to build ecosystems that will be used for other people to build on top of it. Uh, and that's our role. And the second thing I will say is if we go, for example, and we make an integration with Home Assistant, then you are not restricted to one provider, but Home Assistant can integrate more than 1,000 devices, different devices. Whatever you have in your home that is smart, we can already put it there. And what we want to do is to reduce the burden of the user to integrate these kind of technologies. Because usually now if you want to participate, then you need to buy these and you need to buy that and you need to replace whatever you have for whatever thing is new. And if we ask users to do that, they will not do it. Very few actually will do it. What we want to do is what you have, what you have, and how we can use whatever you have to integrate it. Uh, yes, there is uh, still a, a gap. There is still a lot of people that doesn't have these kind of devices, but it starts to go more and more. Um, what they did in Europe, and we can do it easily with the help of the government, is they use uh, legacy devices, old devices. And that's even more interesting challenge and how you can use all devices to connect it and make it work. Uh, but the idea is to be for the user as simple as possible. Uh, the challenges that we are facing is we will ask a lot of flexibility from the users because that's the only way we can actually achieve to do what we want to do. And if you as a user, you have electric vehicle, you will be able to transact with the grid and negotiate with the grid. And that's the flexibility that comes from the users that will support the grid. It's, it's a lot more complex than, it's like whatever device you can imagine that has internet connection, we can plug it there. Yeah. And uh, there is a, we use optimization algorithms to determine uh, first what the user likes, because whatever you like is not maybe the same what other person will like. Uh, so we use artificial intelligence, for example, to learn the thermal preferences of the users, what, what he like, to learn the occupancy of the building. Is it going to be there? Is not there? If it's not there, why will it hit the house? Uh, uh, we, schedule, for example, for the electric vehicle, uh, when he used to recharge the electric vehicle. So it's billions and billions of data that we need to harness and optimize. And, and there is a lot of unclear, uh, there is a lot of questions that still we don't have answer. Uh, but that's why we are opening this, because we don't supposed to answer everything. Uh, we want to collaborate with other utilities, governments, and everyone to try to figure out uh, the questions, yeah, that we have, yeah. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for attending. <laughs>